Tomatoes and potatoes are closely related vegetables and are popular throughout the world. Tomato fruits can be small and cherry-like, or large and beefy, from red to yellow and orange, and some even have a slight purplish color. Potato tubers can be round, oblong, smooth, lumpy, or scaly, from white and golden in color to red and blue. Although we eat completely different parts of these two plants, they are closely related and share many characteristics in common. So new varieties of these species can be made with the same simple techniques. Tomatoes and potatoes belong to the nightshade family Solanaceae, along with peppers and eggplants. The scientific name for the tomato is Solanum lycopersicum, and it is diploid with 12 pairs of chromosomes. It was domesticated in the Andes Mountains of South America and can cross with many wild species. The cultivated tomato fruit is edible, but wild species of tomatoes can have poisonous fruits, which breeders need to keep in mind when crossing with wild relatives. The genes that cause this can be eliminated by crossing repeatedly with the cultivated tomato, a process called back crossing. The potato belongs to the species Solanum tuberosum, the most widely cultivated potato is tetraploid with four copies of each of 12 chromosomes. It originated in South America, cultivated by the Inca as long as 10,000 years ago. Its wild relatives live throughout the Americas and are mostly diploid with 12 pairs of chromosomes. However, other ploidy levels exist. The wild relatives of potatoes are numerous and their compatibilities are complex. Solanum species are monoclinous because the flowers are bisexual or perfect, with both male and female organs. The flowers of tomatoes and potatoes are very similar to each other. They typically have five green sepals behind five petals that are partially fused together. In the potato, the stamens are separate and hold five pollen-producing anthers around the female pistil which contains the ovary and has a stigma to receive the pollen. In the tomato, the anthers are fused together in a cone, which can make controlled pollinations a little more challenging. The flowers of both species are capable of self-pollination and cross-pollination by insects, so care must be taken to prevent undesired pollinations from occurring. Growing them in a greenhouse is the best way to prevent this from occurring. Making controlled crosses of tomatoes and potatoes efficiently requires several pieces of equipment. The most important is a device to dislodge the pollen from the anthers. Some companies make specialized devices, but you can modify the tip of a vibrating toothbrush with a piece of flexible rubber, which will do the trick. To store the pollen between crosses or over the long term, you will need gel caps or small snap cap tubes if the air in your greenhouse is too moist for the caps. To keep the pollen dry, use a container of desiccant, such as non-clumping cat litter. Fine-tipped forceps are optional for potatoes, but a must for crossing tomatoes. And fine gauze or cheesecloth will be necessary for both. Tags and a permanent marker will help you keep track of your crosses, and a knife, scooping tool or spoon, and strainer will aid in tomato seed harvesting. Finally, you will need some small containers for collecting seeds. To maintain the integrity of your crosses, you should also clean your tools and hands with ethanol between crosses. Latex gloves can also help prevent cross-contamination. Pollinations are best done in the morning when pollen is being produced. Potato flowers are the easier of the two to cross. Begin by selecting a mature pollen-producing flower, fold the petals back, and place the anthers just inside your collection tube. Turn on the vibrating toothbrush and gently touch the flower. The pollen will come out of the front of the anthers and into your tube. Eight to ten good flowers will give you enough pollen for over a hundred crosses. Store the tube of pollen in your container of desiccant to keep it dry and viable between crosses. Potato pollen can last several months to a year or more if stored dry in a freezer at minus 20 degrees Celsius. Potato flowers in each inflorescence mature in pairs every few days. 
Remove any mature flowers to keep them from pollinating your cross. To select a flower to pollinate, find a pair of unopened flowers that have petals that are beginning to change color. Younger flowers can be left on if you plan to use them to make crosses, otherwise remove them. Carefully remove the petals with your hands or forceps, exposing the interior of the flower. The flower must be emasculated to prevent self-pollination. Carefully remove the immature anthers without damaging the stigma. To pollinate your flower, insert it into the tube of pollen, gently brushing the side of the tube with the stigma. Your cross is now finished. Label a tag with the date and the two parents of your cross. By convention, the female parent goes first. Tie the label to the stem beneath your cross. A few days later, if you see a fruit developing on your flower, your cross was successful. Wrap the fruit with a small square of cheesecloth in case the fruit falls off before you collect it. You can use the string from the tag to tie the cheesecloth on, or you can use a twist tie if you have one. Three weeks after pollination, remove the potato fruits from the plant and set them aside for another three weeks for the seeds to finish developing. To extract the seeds, squeeze the fruit into a tub of water, rolling it around in your fingers. The viable seeds will sink to the bottom, so pour off any that float. To collect the tiny potato seeds, filter the water through the cheesecloth and set them somewhere to dry. Tomato flowers are smaller and more delicate than potatoes and can be a bit more challenging to cross. Magnifying goggles can help you see the finer details, but they are not necessary. To collect pollen, place a mature flower inside your collection tube and vibrate the pollen out of the anthers as before. Pollen can also be collected on a mass scale by collecting mature anthers in a tube or petri dish. Place the collected flowers in the sun or at least 18 inches below an incandescent lamp for 24 hours to dry. The pollen can be gathered by sifting the contents with a fine screen. As long as it is kept dry, tomato pollen can be stored for long periods of time in a freezer as with potatoes. Tomato flowers mature from the bottom of the inflorescence with the youngest flowers toward the tip. They open about one per day and successful crosses are made with flowers that are two days before opening. Remove any flowers that have already opened and select an unopened flower that does not have any color in the petals. Some breeders remove one or more sepals to indicate the flowers that they have crossed. Using your forceps, carefully remove the petals one by one. The immature anther tube can now be seen, which must be gently teased off of the flower. Sometimes you will need to sever the cone at its base with your forceps, but it can usually be pulled right off the flower. If the pistil is damaged, you will need to try again with a new flower. To pollinate your flower, gently brush the inside of your pollen collection tube with the stigma. To ensure that the stigma is receptive, you can also apply pollen a second time the following day. Once you have a successful cross, label it with the parents and the date, and wrap the developing fruit with cheesecloth. When your fruit has fully matured, cut it open and scoop out the seeds into an open container. Tomato seeds are held in a gelatinous matrix, which can be removed by fermentation. Leave them at room temperature for one to two days to ferment. A mold may form. When the seeds are free from the gel, Rinse them with water in the strainer and set them out to dry. Finally, transfer your seeds to labeled bags to plant the next generation. When a desirable tomato variety has been developed, seed producers can increase the seed on a mass scale or for hybrids, conduct multiple replicated crosses.